What's going on, everybody? Welcome to this week's uh, Lumix live stream. Um, I apologize if you can hear a leaf blower. I think I, I've got it to where it doesn't hear through, but they're like kind of right outside my office door here. So, um, yeah, uh, welcome to this week's Lumix live. We've got um, a really fun interview that I had with uh, Josh Walker, uh, who's a creator for um, you know kind of more off-road outdoor adventure style uh, content. Uh, so I had that interview a little bit earlier this week. So we're going to be playing that uh, and kind of going through through the um, you know kind of questions that I asked him. Uh, and then outside of that, uh, we will also still be doing, you know, some of the AMA, uh, typical question and answers that we've been doing, uh, over the last couple of weeks. So while that is, uh, uh, playing that interview part, uh, I'll be answering questions in the chat. Uh, so if you do have a question for this week's stream, as some have already, uh, submitted, make sure to tag at Lumix cameras before your question. This way I can see it pop up and we can go through the, um, the answers and kind of just get everything ready, set and go for you. Um, and, uh, yeah, before we jump, uh, too far into that, uh, I want to remind everybody about Lumix pro services. Uh, we have the red and platinum tier here available in the United States. Uh, red is free. If you've recently purchased a Lumix camera, make sure to get yourself registered on Lumix pro services red for free. Uh, if you're someone who likes that little bit of extra control uh, and a little bit of extra, uh, you know, kind of support on the back end, uh, make sure to take a look at the Platinum tier as well. Uh, the Platinum tier gives you all the benefits of RED, uh, but in addition to that, you get two-day repairs with next-day shipping both ways. You get 20% off out of warranty repairs. Uh, you get... Uh, access to our membership hotline. So if you're somebody who would rather speak to a person to troubleshoot an issue, you've got access to that during normal business hours. Uh, and then you also get things like annual sensor cleanings, cam uh, lens calibrations, all that kind of fun stuff. Um, and yeah, you just basically get uh, a whole lot of really cool stuff with that program. So if you're interested in it and you're in the United States, be sure to take a look at the QR codes that were up. Uh, we do have links down in the description for Lumix Pro services around. Uh, and yeah, it's pretty much just all, uh, all available in those links. Um, so let's take a look at some of those questions first before we jump into the interview. Um, we have, um, uh, ECS says, uh, I game stream and would like to know how to, uh, know the setup that's being used for this live stream, uh, is using a Lumix camera. So I answered this one a little bit in the, the chat. Uh, so yes, I do stream with our Lumix cameras. Um, right now I'm using an S5 Mark II. Uh, I have been using up until recently uh, the box camera. So I was using a BS1H uh, and then the BGH1 before this one came out. Um, depending on what it is that you want to do uh, streaming wise uh, and the level of control that you kind of want with the camera, um, the box cameras could be a really good solution since you can power it over ethernet and control the camera over ethernet. Uh, so that lets you, you know, not have to reach up and change any settings on the camera. You can use Lumix Tether for that. Uh, and we have a couple streams about that as well. Um, or you can switch into something like the, uh, S5 Mark II, which I'm using now. Uh, since that has phase detect autofocus, if you're someone who's going to be doing presenting to camera, so putting objects up in front of the, you know, in front of your face, that kind of thing. The phase detect can be a really nice advantage for that. But um, if you know that you're not going to really be doing any of that kind of uh, uh, video work, uh, the box cameras, like I said, can be a great solution. We have them in four thirds and we have it in the full frame L mount as well. Uh, other than that, we stream using uh, OBS or actually Streamlabs now. And uh, I have an Elgato 4K capture card uh, that's just taking an HDMI feed from the camera into the capture card and then loading in. Uh, audio wise, our friends over at Rode Microphones have, uh, graciously provided me with, uh, an NT1, uh, microphone. I have an Elgato arm, uh, for the mic arm. And then it also has the, um, forget what this box is called. Uh, the AL1, uh, kind of mixer controller, uh, for the microphone. So, Pretty straightforward setup across the board um, gets gets us this kind of setup, and then I just use LEDs for the lights. So hopefully that helps. Um, I've used this for some game streaming as well. Uh, the microphone's nice, um, and then audio, depending, I don't know where my headphones are now, uh, depending on if I'm doing interviews, I'll wear a pair of Corsair uh, Virtuoso or Virtuous uh, headphones uh, if I'm not using my Panasonic ones. Uh, let's see here. 
Uh, Dave, uh, this is one that actually I wanted to bring up on uh, verbally in the chat because um, I ran into this problem actually myself. Uh, so S5 Mark II, uh, 5.8K 420, and 4K 422, uh, Adobe Premiere on Windows and Media Encoder were crashing. Um, now, I can already hear a lot of people saying, oh, well, don't use Adobe Premiere. However, not all of us like the other program. Some of us like Premiere. I... Uh, my issues, if if you are running into any kind of recent problems and you're on Windows, uh, it seems as though there may be an NVIDIA driver that could be causing some problems. Uh, and then as well as potentially some issues with an update that had recently pushed for Premiere. So I rolled uh, all the versions back a little bit. Uh, and that seemed to fix pretty much all my issues with any kind of stuttering or uh, crashing in the software. So um, it's not anything wrong with the camera or the files from us. It's more just software related. So there may be some challenges there. Um, usually, I always suggest to keep everything as updated as possible with your software and camera firmware. Uh, when it comes to software, that's where obviously sometimes you can run into challenges. And uh, yeah, luckily you can roll back uh, versions of Premiere uh, as well as uh, uh, graphics drivers for um, uh, your graphics card. So that should help. Hopefully that uh, kind of helps you out, uh, Dave. Uh, let's see here. Uh, the other question, um, I have the S5 II, love it. I was going to return it for an A7 IV, but sticking with it for photography, I noticed there's a delay with flash off camera flash. Um, so that is something that I have brought up to our engineering team uh, to see what's going on with the flash delay. Um, cause it is a little different than what we do in the existing S5. Um, so I don't really have any update as far as where that sits at the moment, uh, other than they are looking into it and we'll keep you guys updated as we get, you know, kind of more information or as I can get more information about it. Um, uh, and then follow-up question was, I have Lumix Red, uh, can I switch to Platinum? Yes, if you have Lumix Pro Services Red and you want to move up to Platinum, you can do it within the uh, LPS program. Uh, so you just go onto that page uh, and then you should have a link to upgrade to the Platinum level uh, service. Um, yeah, so outside of that, let's actually jump into the interview. Um, this is with uh, Josh Walker. We did this a little bit earlier this week. So um, yeah, let's check it out. All right, everybody. So I am here with Josh Walker uh, to have a conversation about uh, his style of photography, the videography that he does, and uh, to learn a little bit more about, you know, who you are and what got you into this world. So um, welcome, Josh. How you doing? Hey, uh, I'm, I'm doing wonderful. How about you, Sean? <laughs> Can't complain. It's always uh, it's always a, 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 a fun time catching up with people. You know, we we I think the, the first time you and I actually met in person was at the Tokyo event. Yep. And, uh, yeah, it was just kind of cool. It's for me, it's always fun, uh, meeting someone else who's like a motorhead, like, like I at heart am like before I got into photography and all that kind of stuff. I, I, you know, I was an auto mechanic. I did drag racing, all that kind of stuff. That was my life beforehand. But now actually seeing people who are making a living out of doing some of this stuff in the photography and the videography side and, and actually wrenching on your own cars. It's, it's always kind of cool. So, um, for everyone that's that's tuned in, can you give them a little bit of a, you know, kind of background, who you are, what you do? Uh, I'm Josh Walker. Um, I'm an adventure and motorsports videographer and photographer. Um, I've been fortunate enough to really kind of take my passion for the vehicles and just anything basically that has a motor and shift that into my career of capturing that. Um, so I, I started doing it full time about five, six years ago. Um, before that I, I was, I went through all sorts of different jobs before that I was a driller in the oil field. I ended up getting hurt. Um, and then I got hurt enough that I was told I couldn't go back and it was kind of like, what do you do next? And, um, yeah. I started with a drone and then quickly enough, it was like, well, drone, you can't just, just be doing the aerials picked up the camera and swiftly shifted into um, chasing drift cars and off-roading and all sorts of stuff like that. Um, so I feel very fortunate to be able to kind of take my two passions of capturing stuff and showing it in a different way. And the, the other side of it, of me being a motorhead at heart, I grew up that way. Um, <laughs> I grew up in Alaska, you know, uh, 
off-roading and just wrenching on vehicles so it, it, it's kind of a natural thing so um that's kind of where i'm at i um from here on out now i'm I've, i'm traveling all over the world um you know when met you in tokyo <laughs> next week i'll be in baja um so the the places that the camera's taken me, I'm 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 so happy for. Yeah, no, that's 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 so cool. You know, it's like everyone always I think has this this preconceived notion of you know typical photographers and videographers, right? You know, it's the wedding, the event, the portrait, the you know if it's if it's any kind of outdoor, usually the default that people think of is you know wildlife, but right. it's it. It's amazing to to see, you know, someone that's doing adventure, overlanding, um, you know, just like you said, the the off-road, you know, the the trucks and stuff like that. Like how much actually kind of goes into that and I think it's an area that that gets kind of disconnected with a lot of people cuz we see that content. You know, we're we're used to seeing like, you know, ads from GoPro and you know, anyone that owns any kind of even remotely off-road vehicle has seen all of the ads like Jeep and all that kind of stuff and Ford, you know, seeing all of that kind of content and then actually being able to see someone who's creating that kind of content. And it, there's just, there's so much cool, I think, um, style and look that comes with it that seems to be pretty different from, you know, d the, the different photographer you, you know, and, and videographer that you kind of work with. Um, so what, what would you say, like when, when you're, you know, kind of going out in, in, into like an event to kind of cover it or, or to just kind of create, you know, any kind of content for it? Like, are there, are there certain like kind of steps you go through or looks you kind of always have in your mind that, you know, you want to go for, um, when you're photographing or videoing an event? Yeah, absolutely. And, um, like I said, I, I've 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 done everything from race trucks. So like, it it kind of is uh, goes from project to project as far as what kind of look, how what's the approach going to be with that, you know? So like, oftentimes overlanding is going to be more just as much the vehicle as it is the scenery and the people and the camping and the cooking. So it's it's almost like I got to kind of slow myself down a little bit um, <laughs> to really make sure to capture those those moments because that's 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 a prime example of what you know overlanding is is where we're trying to find the places that people don't normally see you know <laughs> oh yeah. uh, you know like you and and that's what what it allows you to do is where you know like like I said next week I'm going to Baja we're driving days to get to different destinations and we're self-sustaining and um so like that i really want to capture the people the people that i'm with the their reactions to the places so like that you you definitely have to always be ready um because you you only got one chance to, I, I'm not the type that's like, Hey, can you uh, react that way again? You know, can you give me that awe in your face? Yeah. So you got to be on your hands and toes and um, to where on the opposite spectrum of that, um, I just got back from King of Hammers and that's mayhem. Um, and, you, and you have to really like be ready and think you're ready as as ready as possible we picked out a good spot and then the truck suddenly goes the other way and flips and um and being able to rely on on you know the cameras and just me understanding how vehicles like like you were saying oftentimes uh videographers and stuff you know might be trained they have the, they're going to set up and be ready you have to kind of come from it, the background of being a gearhead and having driven something like that to understand that that truck might go this way or that way and, you know, switch yeah. really quick. And so you, I, I suppose my setup for that is just being sure that right on me, I have like, I can't pause them and say, Hey, wrong lens, you know, <laughs> like mm, that's not going to work. You know, I have to, have my have my setup ready to go before I even get it to where 
the overlanding stuff. Yeah, I'm capturing moments, but I can be like, hey, guys, let's pause before we come to the edge of this cliff real quick and get that, you know, revealing shot of somebody pulling up. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. There's there's some stuff that can be st staged to a point, but it's never, just like you said, that, that reaction level of it is... Right, right, it right. It never hits the same. And, if and, I've kinda, and I've kind of made my my way of being a uh, I don't want I don't want it to come off like I'm a film crew where I'm like, hey, pause, back up, go back. Let's do that again. You like I want to be as streamlined as possible, capture it in the moment as we're going. Um, and and that's what really kind of creates those, whether it's off roading or um the you know the other half of it of overlanding and is just kind of letting everybody do their thing and capturing it on the fly instead of being staged up i'm not one setting up a bunch of lights i, I rely on my camera and my ability to know what's going to happen to uh really go with it so i guess to answer that question my setup is making sure <laughs> that i have my camera set up the way i need it i like to roll with two cameras because I will have one set up on a short lens, one set up on a long lens, and you know, um, be able to capture both in an in an instant. Yeah. So that's that's my way of prepping for shots is um, having having multiple setups that are equal but different. Yeah. So the, the, that kind of a, I I think leans right into I think what a lot of people always want to you know, kind of geek out on with this kind of stuff is so what, what, what is your, your typical go-to hardware these days? Um, um, knowing obviously we always change them over time, but is there like a go-to camera lens configuration that you love working with? For the longest time, um, my, my big go-to, I use the S pro 2470 and then the S pro 70 to 200 cause they had such great matching looks, but the different reach. Yeah. Um, and then, but it's kind of shifted. Um, I crushed my <laughs> 7,200. I remember that. Yeah. Ch chasing, chasing a race truck on a dirt bike and I got bucked off and landed right on it. So I don't have that one right now. Uh, so, and like you said, it's been changing. So my go-to right now has obviously been the S5 Mark II. Um, and at like King of Hammers, my favorite lens with that was that newer uh, 300. Was it 70 to 300? I believe. Yeah, yeah. Um, it doesn't. It doesn't quite. You know, it doesn't quite have the S Pro look. Yeah. But it's really good, and 70 to 300 is such a crazy range to be able to cover. So if I want that up close or they're farther away, I can do it, and with the uh, um, stability on it you can you can do it handheld you know um yeah. and, and with that then i have the gh6 and i have that set up with the 25 to 50 i believe yep uh, and that's my if i know it's going to get crazy crazy and i want to get that like strippy slow-mo that's so i and and that's a, that's another thing i got you know there's two different purposes in my kit is the the gh6 really looks amazing when you're trying to do those higher frame rates you know um and <laughs> i love it because a lot of times it's so hard to put in perspective you know you might look at one of these trucks and see a, go, a tire go in the air but that that variable frame rate you're able to really accentuate what's happening and let let the end user understand that like that's wild those are four oh, yeah tires you know six feet up in the air with a thousand horsepower <laughs> and, and so being able to have that and still have great quality yeah. um it's what i like about the gh6 is because you know we all obviously the s5s and the s1s and everything has 180 which is great but you know the the quality <laughs> takes it to where the gh6 really keeps you can maintain quality and it's the happy medium for the, the uh, high speed stuff. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I think, um, I think there's, there's been this kind of like, I, I think transition back with a lot of, a, a, a lot of photographers and videographers that are 
realizing that you know multiple camera setups and and not not to say that this really kind of went anywhere this has been a kind of common thought process but multiple camera setups are kind of a key part of of almost any style of of creation out there because they're all excelling at different components that you need like you said like the gh6 it's pretty much unrivaled in 4k 120 does the s yeah it does the s5 mark ii have 180 frames per second 120 frames yeah maybe not as you know detailed or as sharp as something like the gh6 can do but when you've got those different tools together, you you get the best out of both worlds. And right. I've I, I I've seen some of the 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 stuff that you've shot in in that that slow motion effect, um, like with speed ramping and stuff. And there is just something so cool seeing a giant you know sand rooster tail just flying out behind something, or a truck that like you know, kind of like dives into, you know, some soft silk, you know, silky sand and you just get that huge plume, like, man, slow-mo just makes it look so cool. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> if if we're fine, if we're in the middle of Baja and there's a silt bed, I'm switching to the GA6 <laughs> just because it's, it looks, then I can, you know, now I've been doing it long enough. And if it's not like perfect, you know, to me, like if, if I can't, Put the color in the way i want and all this i i like throw a fit on the inside like i'm like dang that's a cool shot but it just doesn't look as good as it was or as i want to and uh the gh6 allows that you know yeah. i guess that's the kind of progression as 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 a, a professional in this industry is that you're always you always want to do better and and so um this setup allows me to, you know, because, yeah. you know, naturally if it's nighttime and I'm at a camp and I need to do a time lapse of the Milky Way, GH6 isn't what I'm going to pick. You yeah. know, I want that full frame to be able to really get it. And, and the GH6 actually is pretty surprising even in that manner, but <laughs> um, I want that full frame, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And no, I, exactly tools, the, the right tool for the right job. And, you know, I, I think, um, you, you know, kind of going off of that, you know, right tool for the right job thing, you know, we were talking right before we, you know, kind of started recording this that, you know, there's, there's always like these, these kinds of, I think, contentious points that a lot of uh, videographers have and filmmakers have about, you know, the, the delivery side, you know, what is it that clients are asking for when it comes to, you know, do they want 16 by 9? Do they want 9 by 16? Do they want it for the Instagram reel or the TikTok? Um, I would imagine, especially in the in the automotive um, side of the world, I mean, even in the, the ultra amateur stuff I do with the motorcycle clubs around here, vertical seems to be a pretty big push in this, in this market. Is that something you're seeing as you start to move upscale in, yeah, in that yeah. kind of work? It's it's pretty wild because, and it, and it's almost that that internal battle where you're like, but it looks so good if it's, you know, sixteen and nine, it, it, you know, and half the time I want it even more. I want the anamorphic look, you know. Oh yeah. And and that's the internal battle. But then, I've certainly worked myself into a position, and I started doing it long ago. I have a computer screen right next to me that's set up vertical. Because years ago, that was kind of, I started running social media for different companies um, and really pushing that. And which is wild to where like this last trip to King of Hammers, I was working for Nitto Tires and them as a huge corporation. I was there solely to film vertical. Yeah. So so then <laughs> it was kind of like that, that internal battle and trying to learn how, what, like, because you learn what you can really get with you know, whatever, if it's a 24 to 70, you know, like kind of how far you need to stand back, yada, 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 vertical. If they, and they were, and, and a lot of things that I do are looking for quick delivery as well. Oh, yeah. They want that turnaround. Like I'm not sitting on it for months and, and uh, going to put it together and stuff. Half of them are wanting vertical and they want it now. Oh uh, yeah. And and so even, you know, I'm like, oh, I have open gate and I can do this and that. And they're like, we don't even want to mess with cropping, you know, and that's yeah. that's forced me to even, you know, 
like this is this is my gh6 here and <laughs> i have it set up vertically yeah and, you know, like thank i'm so thankful for flippy screens you know <laughs> like a flippy screen but this has been set up to film vertical strictly yeah. and now i mean obviously i i'm always switching it back because that's yeah. that's the natural hold and that's where it becomes <laughs> just even a process to like train yourself to be like mm, let's all right let's do it this way yeah but so vertical and and that's one thing is you know like luckily these you can set them up to automatically flip it and so my quick turnaround is able like I'm, i don't have to be like oh you just have to turn them 90 degrees or whatever it's yeah. plug and play for them um yeah vertical's huge and it's not going away. That's that's the thing. You either that and, and that and that's the biggest thing is like I can be like, well, I want it skinny and wide all I want, but at the end of the day, we are all holding a cell phone that is this direction, and in oh, no yeah. time are they gonna switch to you know, like Yeah. It so it's it's just you accept where things are going <laughs> and um work with it you know so and yeah so it's almost relearning what lenses work where um but yeah vertical is not going <laughs> anybody who thinks vertical is going anywhere it's not yeah yeah you know it, i i i always like to to, to kind of compare it to like the the era of people you know from from film into digital it was you know, film's always going to be here. You know, why would I ever want to go to digital? It's like, well, I mean, unfortunately, that is what people wanted at the time. You want fast turnaround. And it was the same reasons. They want fast turnaround. You want the ability to share things as fast as possible. We're in a, a market where people want quick delivery. The other stuff will still always be there. Um, but I, it's something that I think separates a lot of photographers and videographers from each other is those that are willing to adapt and when the client asks for what they want, they're the ones paying the bills. You know, you you go along with it. Right. Well, and it doesn't mean you don't give up the suggestion of, well, maybe this actually would look good as horizontal, but eh, paying And clients. I do and and even with them, I will have I will have it said that I do push like if say you want vertical, I'll push for using open gate yeah. just so that gives us the options. You I know those <laughs> clips that I'm getting are fire and they're going to be good. Do you want to put it in something maybe wider? Um, yeah. So I'll push for it. But <laughs> then certain clients like that, you know, you're like, well, all right, well, you, here we go yeah. and, and dive right in. And, and realistically, that was a week and a half of filming like that. And then it builds that you just got to build have different habits and be open to it. It's kind of, your videographer and somebody asks you to take a photo, you're probably able to, if you're willing to do it, you know, like, yeah. and, and just instead of being like, mm -mm, I can't do that, <laughs> you know, be open to it and it, it'll help you along. Oh yeah. Yeah. I think all, you know, the, as, as, as much as, you know, being, being lucky enough to work and, and cover a style of photography or videography that you enjoy, still is a job it still does pay bills there are certain times when you know we're not always going to be doing the stuff that we enjoy doing sometimes like you know you, you talk to wedding and event photographers there are a lot of them that are doing it just because it is paying bills they would much rather be doing landscape street stuff that you're doing but you know pays the bills so you kind of just go through it and you get it done and you hope that that is enough to fund the fun things that you want to do outside Absolutely. of it um, like I'll say it a hundred times. I'm fortunate enough to be able to doing what I love, but 1000%. And, and, and with that, I end up probably working harder half the time because I'll take on something that maybe didn't pay as much, but I wanted to do it. So, oh, yeah. you know, and, and to where somebody's like, uh, you don't want to pay that much for the wedding. Yeah, no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> you know? and, and I find myself in pickles like that all the time, but oh, yeah. I'm, I love it and there's nothing else I'd rather do. Nice. Nice. So I I want to um I want to swing in and talk a little bit more about the hardware too. Yeah. Um because 
you and I have, have talked about it before and, um, you know, Sigma was cool enough. They sent us a, a couple, uh, 60 to 600 to send out to different users, um, you know, and kind of just see, you know, what, what the thoughts are. Does it fit in your style of photography and videography? And I know you got the lens and after some fun, uh, uh, delays in shipping and the weather that kind of passed through. I know you got it like, I think you said what, like the day before. Yeah, I got it on running. race day. And, <laughs> and, and, and that's what, that's one thing I, I, the thing with that lens, 60 to 600 in particular, like, do you hear that 60 to 600? It is a wild lens. Like the, the ability to actually use it inside of a room yet reach out and and snipe some pictures you know is amazing um don't get it on race day you need to learn oh, how to use it. it's a it's a tool um that takes practice you know you don't and and that could be for anything like you know and i think maybe we live in this world where we're really spoiled and you're like bam you know put this on here cool we're good to go this is gonna work and you just and it just works so easily and flawlessly yeah where you get into bigger things like that where um you need to practice with it yeah uh, so i got out there on race day and i was not good enough at <laughs> using that lens right out the gate like i thought you know i was just being cocky and just being like oh i'll definitely be able to just figure it out right away um don't do that <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know um because i mean all right to put this in perspective here's yeah. the 24 to 70 yeah it's 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 a sizable lens and oh, then yeah. and then you reach out and is this unlocked no you have to lock it when you zoom in i'm not a small human <laughs> This is gigantic. Oh yeah. So so even even with that, you know, and like I said earlier, I made the twenty four or the seventy to two hundred, the S Pro two point eight. I love that lens, which is no little tiny lens. No, you know that's a hefty lens. Yeah. So I'm definitely used to using something big, and you know, obviously this has got the shield on it, so that makes up a big difference. Um, yeah. but there's a learning curve in using something that size. And especially with me, because like I said earlier, I'm not setting up huge tripods. I'm not like, like I just have a handle on the bottom of this so that I can hold it easier. Yeah. Um, so I'm not that, but, but with the S5 two having such crazy image stabilization, I was like, I think that I can shoot with this and I'll make sure to share um, some of the shots that I got yeah. because I do not believe that there is another setup at 600 that you can hand help hold the way that you can with that. Yeah. So it yeah. can be, it's, it's, it's that, it's that decision. Are you going to work with that tool or not? You know, it's a little more cumbersome, but it's amazing also. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I, I've, I've, um, talked about that lens a little bit in, in the, in prior streams, you know, because like the same thing, like I, I've never really shot with a lens that's as long as that. And like all the different factors that come in and everyone that's in the chat and in, in the, you know, on, on the stream that are used to shooting with lenses like that, this is, this may sound so foreign to some of you because, if you're not used to working with it, it does take that change. Like, as you said, you've got to be in that mindset that, you know, these trucks are coming down this way or, or this car is coming down this way, but you need to be able to know, you know, what framing the distance, how that, you know, how that lens is going to work. If they make this turn, I know I got to go to this, you know, this setup, that setup, adding a new lens into that is always kind of like that. Oh yeah, that's right. This is like not my normal system that I work with. The focusing setup's different. The the unfortunately the zoom rings are different between our lenses and theirs. And They're that, all back even to even to yeah, even to me the the zoom ring was a big deal. And I've used like my my the where I really started honing all my skills. I used a Sigma 
18 to 35 on a gh5 you know like and and the equivalent 50 to 100 yeah. so i've i've used sigma lenses but you get used to something and then you're like come on come on and in in a front like i said that lens don't get on race day get it after. yeah yeah just just a little bit of time to be able to practice with it but um right. so so with 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 a lens like this um you know again like we were talking before we we started recording you know there there are opportunities where a lens like that you know can probably be you know better suited for certain things like have, have you seen like doing the the setups where like your 70 to 300 or 70 to 200 would be your kind of go-to would you see using the 600 to the 60 to 600 in that case or do you see other use cases where say if if it was going to be permanently in your kit where you would probably see that lens fitting better absolutely um just yesterday it was a, a coin flip i randomly decided to go out the canyon outside of town and i was like well, there's big bighorn sheep sometimes sure enough they're right there and when I say right there, I mean, they're bighorn sheep. They're not right there, yeah. but you could see them. And that allowed me to get that close up. Um, Cause uh, to me, that's, that's half of it is being able to reach out there and show a different perspective that you don't see from the side of the road, pulling over being like, wow, look at those Rams, you know? Yeah. Um, or, or here I'm super excited. I'm like, I think I've said three times now because I'm going to Baja <laughs> uh, here next week. And one of our big stops is a beach that I've heard that you can see gray whales from. And I'm praying that I can see gray whales. Cause if I can see them with my eyes, that means that's going to do me really good. And so that's, that's where I can see something like that. And especially for the cost of it and like, there's so many upsides. Like, there's no way a lens that big usually costs that price. No. And um, I can see how that would be a usable tool in a kit, you know, where there's shots that are not doable. And I've made it, I've made it, I've made my way being able to, you know, use 422 and use a 200. And then I can crop in and I can make do. It looks yeah. pretty good. But 600 is way different than that, you know, and, that, and that's something. And I will even say that, you know, I was pretty impressed yesterday because it was snowing at a crazy rate. Um, I, I didn't even tell you this yet, but like <laughs> the the animal detect, re even with that, was able to punch through. I'm talking at a, I think we were getting three inches an hour or something. It was oof, a snow wall. And uh it was able to reach through the snow and get the rams, which I was like, this is just not even realistic to even say that that would work, but it did, you know, and it was finicky at times and it wouldn't find it. But then I was able to get it on there and keep it. And that was, that was a huge thing where I was like, this isn't really a realistic thing to even expect from any camera system. How are you even seeing through that snow? Because I'll share, I'll make sure to share that with you. But yeah, I can I can see where you would find a space in your kit if you're doing things um, where you're in the middle of nowhere. I, I I think that this next trip into Mexico, where you know we'll be at, at times depending on um, vehicle setups and whatnot, are I think we're on this trip we're 15 vehicles deep, so you'll get spread out where you're miles apart. Yeah. And 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 you're on the coastline going on on cliffside coastline where oftentimes I find myself all the time being like, gosh, I wish I had something that could reach out and get that that crazy perspective from one curve to another curve with ocean in the middle. And there's certainly spots for a lens like that outside of just, you know, animals. Yeah. You know, because typically that's where you see that or, you know, football, sports, whatever. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I I think there's unique instances that that really can be a game changer. I'm going to test it out. Here. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, um, we're actually at, at time uh, for uh, what we've got, you know, slotted for this one. But um, where... Um, 
before we kind of close out, where can everyone check out, you know, what, what it is that you're doing, the video, the photos, all that kind of stuff. Where can they follow you? Because you've got some seriously cool stuff that I think everyone should be checking out. Um, like, I just... I, I love your work because I love automotive and I love the the adventure, the outdoor stuff. And I think so many other people sure. would love to see it too. Um, you can typically and realistically, I've been giving everybody all my stuff and usually it's just spread about, but you can find me on Instagram. I'm Joshua Walker. Um, one, I was kind of talking to you about it earlier about putting my face in front of cameras because I'm not usually like that. So I really plan to ramp up my YouTube and kind of show a little more of the behind the scenes because that's like you were saying earlier that's something that typically people don't even realize is the stuff you go through and what you're doing to capture those automotive commercials or whatever that you're seeing so um yeah. that's also i'm joshua walker is facebook instagram and youtube so very cool very cool and we will link those down in the description below so um yeah i i mean Man, thanks so much for for taking the time and and chatting with me for a little bit. Um, like I said, it was it was so cool to finally meet you in person in Tokyo. Um, it's amazing right. that it took us to go halfway across halfway around the world to actually meet each other in person. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I, I I look forward to continuing to see some of the cool stuff that you create, and um, you know maybe we'll we'll be able to to do another in person uh, kind of event. Yeah. And maybe, Maybe we'll do a, a an actual live stream in person with like the bigger group of people that were all there. That'd too. be great. So, yeah, yeah. It was, that's that's definitely next time we get to hook up in real life. That'll be great. Yeah. Um, thanks for having me. Um, yeah. And if anybody has any questions or anything, always feel free to reach out and ask whatever it might be. I'm a wealth of information. <laughs> so. <laughs> Awesome. Awesome. Well, thanks again. And uh, yeah, let's uh, go back to the studio. So uh, yeah, thanks again, uh, Josh, for spending the time with me uh, earlier this week. Um, he said Josh is a really fun, fun person to, to talk to. And uh, I, I truly do mean it. A lot of his work, um, you know, that he's got up on on Instagram, on YouTube, stuff like that. It is it's really cool uh, stuff to see if you like uh, outdoor, more adventure uh, kind of stuff, you know, automotive, off-road racing, stuff like that. So um, be sure to take a look, uh, check out Josh's work, give him a follow. Um, we always love supporting other uh, content creators here uh, that are using Lumix equipment. Uh, and, and that goes for everybody else too in the chat. You know, typically YouTube doesn't really like when people start throwing links in the, uh, in the chat, but you know, check out each other's work. There's a lot of talented people in the chat and, uh, yeah, it's, it's really, really awesome stuff. Um, so let's move on to, uh, more of the Q and a stuff that we've, uh, typically been doing, uh, and kind of go back through and address some of the questions that came through, uh, during the, uh, during the interview part. Um, one of the questions as I scroll back up here in my chat is to take a look at, um, one of the questions here, uh, was actually from David. Um, it says auto, uh, auto white balance, uh, works pretty good in stills, uh, but not necessarily in video since it can shift while recording. It would be great to have a lock auto white balance, uh, while recording option. And, uh, well, I believe this was, uh, you know, maybe more leaned towards a uh, different camera. Um, yeah, since uh, David was mentioning that uh, uses the GH6, uh, if you're someone who's picking up the S5 Mark II, uh, this is actually something that we have implemented in the S5 Mark II, and um, I would imagine is going to be something that is carried forward uh, pretty much in our cameras moving forward. So... I wanted to um, take a look here and uh, connect into my S5 Mark II to uh, basically just kind of show you guys, you know, how this works, what it is that, uh, you know, you'd be looking for in, in this kind of setup. And uh, we've talked about it a little bit before, you know, the, the, all the different menu options, and we've got a couple different streams on where some of this stuff is. But for this in particular... Uh, what you'd see is that when you go into the uh, the actual custom settings, uh, so if we go here, I'll go back out and show you. This is in the gear menu, so this is custom. Uh, under the image quality page, and this is page one of that, you'll see that we have auto white balance lock settings. 
Um, this is for setting a lock to your auto white balance. Now, Operation Sync with Shutter would be, you know, kind of really prioritizing this for the photography side of this. So you can have it where it's during uh, during a burst setting uh, set of shots, or you can have it while you're half pressing the shutter. Uh, but then you also have lock hold with an FN button. So what this allows me to do is I'm going to press and hold on the front uh, custom function button on my S5 Mark II. And you'll see I can go into uh, FN group one, and this is image quality page three, and you'll see a, uh, AWBL for lock. So now what it means is that while I'm in auto white balance, I can press that button, and in the top left above the HDMI uh, sync uh, notification, you'll see now it says auto white balance lock. So this lets me manually go in here and trigger that, hey, the auto white balance is set, I want to have it stay at what that uh, option was so that when I start recording or taking photos, uh, that white balance is locked at what it was set for, um, you know, when I did that particular setup. It can be very useful for situations where, you know, if your lighting is changing, your lighting, you know, not every opportunity or every shoot that you're going to have is going to have the ability to control the lighting and, the in-camera presets may not always be 100% accurate to the exact lighting scenario that you're in. And if you're someone who doesn't necessarily like to use, you know, Kelvin temperature or you don't know what the Kelvin temperature is, you could use something like auto white balance lock to let the camera determine it and then lock it in place so that it doesn't vary while you're actually uh, moving through. Um, one of the other follow-up questions here was uh, from Eric, which was uh, about uh, support for tethering. Uh, capture for your uh, Lumix cameras in Lightroom on one, Capture One, etc. Uh, and I kind of replied to this one in the chat, but I wanted to address it again because it prompted me to put up a poll uh, here uh, for everyone to just kind of let me know what you, what you think. Uh, when it comes to tether support and raw editing support, usually there's no barrier from the brand to a software company for deploying, you know, raw editing software. What ends up happening a lot of times is just delays, right? Um, and delays in the sense that when does it fit into their, you know, software update cycle? Uh, so like Adobe just released, uh, recently released raw support in Adobe Camera Raw. So you've got uh, S5 Mark II raw support in things like Lightroom, Lightroom Classic, uh, Lightroom Mobile for iOS and Android. Uh, and then you also have it in Photoshop or anything that uses the ACR platform. This also means that you have the DNG converter available if you're using a software that doesn't have support at this moment. You can use Adobe's standalone uh, digital negative converter, which will take our RW2 files, convert them to DNGs, and then you can use those DNGs in your program. Um, when it comes to other programs like Capture One, uh, Capture One has posted on their website that future supported cameras is that Q2, the S5 Mark II, will be getting raw support in the software. But when it comes to tethering, that is, that's a little bit more of a nuanced thing, right? That comes down to, you know, you needing to let your voice be heard by the software manufacturer that, hey, I use this camera, I want to use your software for tethering. The more people that actually say, hey, I want this, this is what I need, the higher the likelihood is that you're going to see that be added in a more timely manner. Um, it It's kind of just one of those those things that, that, that pushes that kind of development forward. Uh, we do have tethering support. We have an open SDK that allows different uh, software companies to integrate our control uh, over USB uh, into their software if they choose to. Um, but we also understand that some people would like, you know, different levels of support. So the more information you can let software companies know, the more information you can let us know, uh, helps us determine where we should be putting resources for things like that. Um, as I said, our Tether software, we do have free standalone Tether software that can integrate into the other, these other programs through hot folders. Um, that's Lumix Tether. I think it's on like version 2.4 now. Uh, so you can always at least get through with that and then have your raw files go to a folder that's watched for, you know, the editing software that you want to work with. Um, let's see here. Uh, before I go into the question, it was about what's the difference between the S5 Mark II and an S5 Mark II X. Let me check on, uh, some of the other questions before I go in, you know, too deep into that part of it. Um, public specs. 
Uh, what are some good tips for getting the most and best performance out of the autofocus and the S5 Mark II in photo and video? Um, so it's a bit much to talk about this week. However, uh, I've already recorded part of the segments for next week's uh, Lumix live stream since we're going to end up having to be a recorded stream while I'm away on work. Um, and I am talking actually a lot about the autofocusing system next week. So we will have that video up there. Um, that'll actually probably get posted tomorrow. Uh, so it'll be set for a premiere. You'll be able to, to you know, check it out. Um, live chat will be enabled for that one um, because I can watch the live chat later, even though I won't be able to monitor it in real time. Uh, so make sure to uh, subscribe, get yourself set up for next week's live stream because we're going to go in depth into that. Um, it is, it's just a lot of information to cover in the next 10 minutes. Um, Manda, uh, not a question, but I'd love to see a compact 100 to 400 lens for the S series or even just a 400 millimeter prime would be cool to see. Uh, yeah, I, I think, um, you know, what the S5 Mark II and the Mark II X are bringing to the L-mount system is, you know, that, that ability now that we're going to see more lenses be developed. We're going to see more cameras get developed on the new platform. Um, we've talked about it. Our directors talked about it that, um, you know, after this camera development, you're going to see faster development than we have in the past. Um, a lot of times this kind of stuff, you know, it takes a lot to get to that point, And then now it's in the refining phase and then the kind of um, distribution of technology into different uh, areas within our line. So uh, be sure to, to keep subscribed to all of our social channels and in these kind of uh, conversations because, you know, a lot more will come. Whether or not I can say that we've got a 100 or 400 uh, in the plans, um, I, 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 don't, I don't believe we do. Um, but I, I also wouldn't ever put it out of the realm of possibility. Um, the more information you let us know of what optics you want to see, what uh, focal ranges you want to see, uh, that's just more information that helps our team, you know, figure out what the next uh, next options would be uh, to come out. Uh, let's see here. Uh, thank you for the information. Well, thank you, Carlos. Um, I see I am Josh Walker is here. Hey, what's going on? Um, red frame tech, uh, the auto white balance lock would be great to have on the GH6, uh, future firmware question mark. Uh, I don't know if that's something that will come to the GH6, uh, but it is something that we can push for, uh, from our side and, and see what, what, uh, can, can kind of happen from it. So, um, let's take the last, uh, last about seven minutes that I have here before I have to unfortunately actually call this stream pretty close to the, the two o'clock mark here in, uh, central time. Uh, and talk about the S5 Mark II versus the S5 Mark II X. Um, now, as a lot of you have probably noticed, I've been not really wanting to talk much about the S5 Mark II X yet. Um, you know, we've... The S5 Mark II is the camera that's currently available. The Mark II X is still going to be uh, a little bit of time away. Um, we've mentioned that from the day one of launch. Uh, so really, you know, knowing that the bulk of people have, that have purchased an S5 Mark II want information right up front, that's why we've been focusing so hard on that camera. But... Uh, when it comes to the Mark II X, I think um, to kind of start with dispelling some of the rumors that I've been seeing online, one is that, um, you know, maybe there's a physical difference between the two, and no, there, there really isn't. It is the same external chassis as the S5 Mark II, so same button layout, um, you know, same control layout as the S5 Mark II, but there is a cosmetic difference, so you have the fully blacked out design, um, it, it, it's just that, that whole change of the way the camera's going to look. Um, I do not believe I have my S5 Mark II X dummy readily available to show y'all right now, but, um, yeah, like, you can see these pictures online. We've published them. If you go to websites like B&H, Amazon, Best Buy, wherever you want to buy your equipment from, um, any dealer that sells it here in the U.S. or abroad, uh, you'll see the product photos of the, of the camera, and that's, that's the camera. Um, but what is very different between the two of them is all down into the internals. You know, what the cameras are capable of comparing uh, from one another. And I'll go back to the logic of, you know, why we've created the S5 Mark II and an S5 Mark II X. And it comes down to choice. There are a very large number of users that want to get into a Lumix camera and cameras in general that have no need or desire 
for some of these higher end video functions. So think things like ProRes RAW, uh, ProRes video recording, SSD recording for video capture, um, all intra codecs, stuff like that. And even down into things like the wireless and wired IP streaming. So that would be live streaming out to, to uh, different sources. Um, because we know that the market and the users out there that there is a sizable amount of people that have no no need or desire for those things and typically have the logic that, you know, I don't want to pay for that if I'm never going to use it. Well, that's why we created the S5 Mark II. You still get a number of the core video features. So you have that, you know, the 6K open gate recording. You've got, you know, higher bit rate uh, recording functionality, slow and quick, phase detect autofocus. You get the bump up in resolution on the viewfinder compared to the original S5. Um, and you get the, the reliability that you'd expect in our top tier products. So we still created a camera that gives you all of that functionality and that flexibility. So it really does become a solid tool for someone who's, you know, kind of bouncing back and forth between photo and video, but may lean a little bit harder towards video. And with that, we're able to knock the price down a little bit because you're not having to worry about, you know, does this particular feature costs licensing fees. Is this something that's still in development and R&D costs are being recouped for development? Stuff like that. Um, so that's one of the, the differences there. When you go to the S5 Mark II X, like we said, it's gonna get all intro recording. It's gonna get ProRes internal recording and through, um, uh, it'll have the SSD support. You'll be able to do, uh, I think we said up to 800 megabits per second for uh, all intra options available in the camera and up to certain, I, I think it's like up to, uh, since the camera is going to be running on SD cards, which again, this is public information. You can look at spec sheets. Um, it's spec with dual SD cards. Uh, you know, look at cameras like the GH6 and where different card, uh, requirements are for different bit rates. Um, we have the ability to add in, uh, um, uh, as I said, ProRes internally. Uh, and that's internally and, and honestly, SSDs can be considered internally as well. So you've got a lot of that kind of control is, is adding in with this platform. And then honestly, you get the really, you know, awesome look, a totally stealthed out camera. Um, you know, even if you're a photographer, um, you know, my personal, uh, approach on the cameras. And when we were talking about the development of this camera, I was a big proponent of it. You know, I love the blacked out design. Um, Early in, in my career in photography, I would, you know, like most others, we would black out the logos on the cameras because you don't necessarily want people seeing, you know, what brand you use or whatever. You know, that's one of the kind of cool things that you can, that you get with this. We've already done that to it. The, the overall fit and finish just f looks a lot nicer on the Mark II X. So if you are a photographer, the Mark II X could still be an awesome camera for you. Um, it's got the... Um, the uh, S5 Mark II X is going to have and ship with Live View Composite, which is something that's going to come with a free firmware upgrade to the Mar uh, S5 Mark II, the current one. So you're not going to lose anything if you're looking at it from a photography perspective. You just get a whole bunch extra on the Mark II. Excuse me, on the Mark II X. Um, aside from that, I mean, you know, it really kind of just comes down to what what is your primary focus for the camera? If it leans heavier into video. The Mark II X could be the better choice for you. Um, if the only higher-end video spec that you think you're ever going to need or ever want is, you know, raw video recording, then, you know, the S5 Mark II with the SFU unlock would be, you know, could be a good choice for you as well. Or if you're just someone that likes the styling of the white on black with the logos, that could be enough reason. Um, it is, it's another reason why, you know, the prices are relatively close between them. It's all about choice. We know that, you know, there are users that are going to always want to have the top tier, the best, you know, that you can get, you know, for value. And yeah, cool. Go for an S5 Mark II X, pre-order one, get yourself on a list there so that, you know, you're getting one when they, they first come out or hopefully you get one when they first come out. Um, but if, if you don't need any of that stuff, you've got choice. Um, and I'll, I'll reiterate that point as much as I can. The S5 Mark II and the S5 Mark II X are about choice. You don't have to settle for a camera that has things that you may never ever want to use or don't ever plan on wanting to use. Um, uh, and then, uh, as I said, um, 
Will cage for the S5 fit the S5 Mark II? Um, unfortunately, no. The cage for the S5 original will not fit the S5 Mark II. I think there might be one out there that does because it was generic enough. Um, the S5 Mark II is a little bit taller uh, than the S5, uh, the original one. Uh, so because of that, the um, the penaprism area, or what would have been a penaprism, it sits a few millimeters taller. So the cages have to be designed to actually go up over the top of that. Um, this is the small rig uh, cage that I use on my camera. Um, and for me, this has been like, you know, a really nice cage. Uh, I love the Condor Blue one as well. It kind of just depends on what your, uh, your kind of direction is. Um, the uh, small rig cage is very, you know, form fit. It's really, you know, kind of compact. They're typically less expensive than something like the Condor Blue Cage, uh, but the trade-off there is that you don't necessarily have as many mounting points uh, for different accessories. The Condor Blue Cage has tons of mounting points. You get the rosette built into that as well, so if you're someone who really likes to rig your kit up, um, that kit, that cage is, is awesome for it. Um, but that's kind of the cool thing. You have choices. You've got you know, depending on your style and, and the way you like to set your camera up, you've got those options out there and they're in various different uh, price points. So, uh, let's see here. Dave says, um, don't need ProRes. ProRes RAW, which is one of the reasons I want the S5 Mark II over the S over the X, but the only codec I would have liked to have on the S5 Mark II is the all intro. Yeah, I, I, think, um, I think what a lot of people forget is that the original S5, um, that also didn't have all intro. You had to go to an S1 and higher uh, to get all interest. So, you know, unfortunately, certain things like that, like will the S5 Mark II, the base model Mark II, will that get, um, you know, the all intro recording? Probably not. That's what the Mark II X is for. If you do need those, that is where you'd have to go with that. Um, but yeah, you kind of have to look at it and say, is that worth the, the money for you for that, that specific uh, codec? Or, in a lot of cases, is it actually something that, that legitimately would show an image quality difference, or does it come down to editing uh, side? Um, personally, I like having all intra. I like being able to play with ProRes and stuff like that when I, you know, kind of want to play with it. Um, but in my case, I haven't really seen a need for much of it. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Small Rig is an impressive company. Yes, it is. Ah, Charbax, you're back. Haven't seen you in quite some time. Uh, let's see here. Uh, will we see any new updates to the Lumix box camera line? Um, we have from a software perspective, uh, we did just actually release, um, uh, software, uh, updates. So firmware updates for the box cameras. Um, let me actually pull that up. If I can spell the word firmware, that would be nice. Uh, yeah, we, we did actually just release firmware for the BGH-1 and the BS-1H. Uh, and then we also, um, so I'll drop this here. Uh, whoop. Let's do this. Uh, firmware. Again, if I could spell firmware update, that would be awesome. Man, I'm just tripping over my fingers here. Uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, we, we did get the, um, uh, firmware updates there. Uh, Lumix Tether, I believe, also got updated, so, um, we have the change logs up there for, uh, what you've got, uh, added in there. Things like View Assist is now there. LUT Applied, uh, uh, can be displayed, uh, via Lumix Tether, um, Lumix Sync when you're set into V-Log, so you can use external tools and not have to be stuck with just V-Log. Uh, and then there's some other, you know, kind of, uh, updates that also happened within it for, streamlining and making things more efficient uh, when using the software as well. Uh, is the all eye on the S5 Mark II X going to be fully internal or SSD only because of the bit rates involved? Uh, I can't go into too much detail just yet because that's not published in the public specs yet. What I can tell you is look at what the GH6 can do for all intra internally to the SD cards and what requires to go to CF Express or SSD. That'll give you a very good indication of probably what the S5 Mark II X will be able to do for all intra and ProRes. Um, Automat, we want B-RAW over HDMI in the S5 Mark II, please. Um, it definitely heard that one a lot. Um, it's interesting to see what the mix between Blackmagic RAW and ProRes RAW uh, is in the market. So we've definitely passed that on to uh, our team 
uh, as far as that goes. Um, let's see here. Uh, Charbex, how good is the Panasonic PDAF? Uh, well, independently, um, it's being considered in the top three. Uh, in one, in the, and remember, this is our first iteration of it. We haven't even published any additional updates to the focusing system yet. Uh, this is our first shot, and we're being considered in you know the top three by independent reviewers. So, um, and then the last question I can cover today because it is actually already five after. Uh, what will the 200 pound update uh, give to the S5 Mark II, and when will it be available? So. For the S5 Mark II, the SFU2 upgrade, uh, which is the $200, uh, 200 US dollar, 200 pound, uh, and then I forget what the um, euro is on it. Uh, that update is going to give you uh, access to raw over HDMI only. So that $200, you get access to, uh, currently uh, we have support for ProRes raw over HDMI or HDMI data supporting ProRes RAW on the Atomos Ninja 5 Plus. My understanding is that it's the only the Plus at this moment. Uh, you would have to check with Atomos to see if they plan on supporting the Ninja 5 uh, for whatever reason. Um, other than that, you will see um, the other updates that we're going to push on the S5 Mark II. We've stated we're bringing the... Uh, uh, live view composite functionality is going to be added as a free update. That's just a standard, you know, firmware update there. Doesn't require an unlock code. Um, and then, uh, yeah, that's pretty much it at this point. Um, if you know that you need raw and you know that you also want things like all intra and the actual ProRes recording options, you know, on board in the camera, then you'd probably want to take a look at the S5 Mark II X uh, as the primary there. Uh, and then availability will be around the same time as the S5 Mark II X release, which uh, I don't have a specific date that I can provide everybody other than um, should be coming uh, very early spring. So uh, we're, we're actually getting pretty close to when uh, hopefully we'll have some more information that we can uh, share with you all here on Lumix Live. Um... Um, let's see here, uh, let us, uh, well, let me see your LED lights, uh, the ones back there, they're Hue LED light strips, uh, is what I use back there, and then two Elgato key lights. Uh, cool, uh, thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in and checking out the interview and the questions that you all asked, um, like I said, next week we are on a recorded stream, uh, so that will be a YouTube premiere here on the Lumix, uh, cameras channel. Uh, be sure to uh, subscribe to the channel, get yourself set with notifications for when that video is posted. Um, I will not be able to monitor the chat live next week. Um, unfortunately, I will be uh, tied up with some other business. Uh, however, uh, the live chat will be running because I will be monitoring it after the uh, uh, stream's over, so checking for questions. So feel free to ask your questions in the chat. Um, it actually helps the algorithm better if you drop your questions in the comments. Uh, it helps the videos get better uh, visibility on YouTube and all that stuff. So uh, if you want to uh, hear more about what we're going on uh, throughout these different streams, make sure to get subscribed, hit the like button, the bell icon, all that fun stuff. Follow us over on our social media channels. Uh, we just actually reached over 200,000 followers on TikTok. So if you want something where you can uh, just kind of kill a ton of time and just have some funny content, go take a look at us over on uh, TikTok. Follow us on Instagram, all that fun stuff. And if you have recommendations for future stream uh, topics that you want us to cover, leave a comment in the video. Uh, leave a comment after the video is posted. Uh, let us know what topics you want to see covered, and we'll work on getting them uh, recorded and segments uh, filled out on them. Other than that, uh, yo, do you got an Instagram? Uh, I do. You can find me uh, online at what is my Instagram account? Uh, my Instagram account is um, SMR Photo 87 over on uh, Instagram. That is me. Uh, yeah, other than that, thank you, everybody. I hope you have a great, awesome uh, rest of your day. Have a great weekend. Uh, and yeah, we will uh, see everybody next Thursday, 2 p.m. Eastern time on our recorded stream, and then we'll be live again the following week after that. Take care, everybody. Later.